Hey, Josh. Hey, <clears throat> hey, Hora, how are you feeling? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Back to work. Uh, so everything is fine. How about you? OK. Um, the, um, the nice thing about um, uh, having um, having to record all of these things in advance for KubeCon is that there's, well, and publish all these things in advance is that there's actually very little, little left to do at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I've started having this weird like online conference stress because like the day or two before the conference, I feel like I should be preparing more, but I don't need to because I did the presentation weeks ago. And so I've got this like weird feeling that I've forgotten to do something. Yeah, although, yeah, and, and actually, well, it got really weird when it got down to like the hour before the presentation, when normally I'm used to running through a rehearsal and adding last minute tweaks on my slides. Yeah. And yeah, and then there's just nothing not doing to do any of that. Done. It, it, it's almost like you're attending somebody else's presentation and just answering questions on it. Yeah. <laughs> which, which almost, but not quite, makes up for the 12 hours it takes to get a good recording of a one of a 45 minute presentation. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, hold on. I was just looking for which password keeper I put in the ID for this call so that I can actually record it. I did this thing a while ago where I was going to move from one password to um, um, Bitwarden. And then in the middle of it, one password started offering free password keeping to the Kubernetes project. So I decided not to move, but now I've got like half. <laughs> um, wait, you know what? I don't think I actually have, oh. I don't think I actually have the host key for this one, but it appears that we're recording anyway. Uh, it's currently recorded, so okay. Amy, Amy should take care of it. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, welcome to the uh, governance working group uh, meeting for November tenth. Um, the um, it um, uh, as usual we're under the CNCF code of conduct, but all of you know that. Um, I did actually invite a couple of projects who had had governance questions to come by this meeting, but we will see if they do. Um, in the meantime, the only other thing that I have on the agenda is um, I published a pull request with a template for a couple of the most sort of common types of, gov of governance requested. Um, I opened that and started to look at it and put it on my task list even to review it before this meeting and then I forgot. Yeah. I did take a quick look at it and it looked good. Um, yeah, the goal was, I took two of the most common types of governance, right? One is like straight up maintainer or council one. And the other one is simple, is uh, steering committee elections. And I tried to come up with the simplest, most generic version of each one of those. Um, as a as a starting point for projects. The third one that I wanted to do, which is another common type, is um, your sort of composite or sub project amalgamation, where you have multiple sub projects, and then there's a leadership council that's composed of the leaders of the sub projects. Um, but um, I haven't honestly been able to find a good example of that to start from. And my goal for these was to not come up with a wholly synthetic example that wasn't even similar to anything anybody had, had adopted mm -hmm. because I'm not sure it would be useful, right? Because like I know the maintainer council one is useful and I know the elections ones are useful because they are both 
derived from charters that projects are actually using. Yeah. I wonder if VM has, has any suggestions since she's been compiling that list of charters and governance docs. I wonder if she knows of a good yeah. example. I started poking through that, but of course you can't search on them on that basis. No, I would ask um, her and see if she remembers. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I could do that and see if she, yeah, if she actually knows those. I was also going through obviously a bunch of the CNCF ones and a couple of the CNCF projects basically do have that sort of general form but they have it in such a complicated, because like I started off basing something on the Prometheus starter. And I realized that the Prometheus thing was so complicated and particular to the Prometheus project that it wasn't going to genericize well. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, and um, I don't know, we'll see. Um, I've been, the network tools working group for, for CNCF has been talking about actually becoming a project as well as a working group. And if they do that, then they will have that form of government, governance. So maybe I'll have the chance to write one. But in the meantime, I don't expect to get one ready for KubeCon. Yeah, I just, I just took another quick look at it and dropped in LGTM on the pull request. Cool, okay. Um, I'm sure we'll want to tweak those later on. The other thing I wanted to get ready for KubeCon is I do have this sort of in in from another publication, this roundup of all the different kinds of paperwork that a project might want to have. Um, and um, I'm hoping to get that finished before next week. And this is basically just this paperwork with a paragraph of description. Um, you know, with the idea that at some point we will have examples or um, templates for most of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be good to have. Yeah. And that's pretty much all that I have for this meeting. Don, you already said in another meeting that you wouldn't have time to do anything you haven't already done. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. I'm still I'm yeah. still on the hook to do the charter documentation, but I have just haven't gotten around to it. And things have been a bit hectic. The problem is like I'm I'm out for so many days with, with KubeCon next week and then I'm actually taking the whole week of Thanksgiving off even though it's not a holiday here, but everybody else has taken the week off. So I felt jealous and I had extra vacation days. So that means I'm trying to cram like everything into this week. Like all of my meetings are pushed into this week. Yeah. I, I have the advantage that pretty much everybody that I work with is going to be involved with KubeCon. So I expect most of my regular meetings next week to be canceled by other people. Yeah. Very true. So it's already the case that that I'm not hearing from anybody at the CNCF, <laughs> except right now. Hi, you are. <laughs> the, um, so Um, well, we'll get that when we have um, a web page, I guess. Because you saw uh, Carolyn's been working on the contributor web page. And I think one of the things that we can do once we have that is put up the schedule of meetings for this so that people know, oh, hey, Charles. People know that they can just drop by this meeting if they're looking for governance advice. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it'll be I think it'll be good once we have that website up.
Hey, Charles. You um. Did you come here with questions? Or are you showing up to help? Just showing up to help. Cool. Um, I think there's an, a meeting this afternoon that I think we'll actually have questions for. Yeah, that's a contributor growth meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Which is but, for for your project more what you're working on. Yeah. Because you kind of um, have your governance set up. Yeah. And Catherine will be there for that one as well. So, yeah, yeah I'm just looking at uh, the doc for this one now. Let's see what's on the old agenda here. Yeah, not a whole lot. Okay. Oh, one of the things I actually wanted to mention here is um, just so people know. Um, the um, so after that whole long discussion with the TOC about steering committees and alternate ways to approach the multi-organizational requirement for projects for graduation, et cetera, um, we do not have a clear mandate for anything they want us to prepare. Okay. Um, there was a suggestion that somebody try to draft requirements that target more the actual critical elements, you know, survivability and, um, um, ensuring that contributions are welcome regardless of source. Um, the, um, but the TOC never took a vote or even a lazy consensus to say that was the direction they wanted to go in. So, so that remains unchanged probably to be an item of discussion again at some point in the future. And in the meantime, we will continue to work with projects on, um, becoming multi-organizational for graduation. Cool. Um, what was the website you're just mentioning? Is that something that I can, is there, are there, is it open source? Uh, yeah. Um, so yes, yes, there is. So hold on, let me get you. Um, so Carolyn has started working on a simple Netlify website. Um, not actually sure where the repo is for that. Actually, now where, is, where the source code is located? I was a bit confused about it. Yeah. Uh, it's on the C contributor strategy under the website repo, probably uh, under the website branch. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't I really had a chance to take a look at it. The, yeah. Uh, I mentioned on Slack that it would be great to have all this, all the source code and all the information to be put under the probably under the contribute repo that CNCF is currently hosting and eventually just to merge both both initiatives into the single one and that's that's it. Just not to not to create too many too many related things. The um yeah I kind of I mean I do admit that and this is really more for the general meeting that having one website called contribute.cncf.io and a second one called contributors.cncf.io would be problematic. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because yeah. um, people would never remember to distinguish the two of them. The um... Yeah. So we, we can just use both domains. One of them can, re can redirect to another one and that's it, just to merge everything under the, under the same website. I'm well, happy so they, to help with this. Uh, I'm happy to help with this from the CNC okay. side if something okay. will be well, needed. Okay. But... Well, yeah. So the answer would be um, since Carolyn's leading this effort to go ahead and coordinate with her in that, and then maybe give us the ability to push things to yep. the contribute site. I guess yep. the question is, if we change the path of stuff that's on the contribute site, what are we going to break? 
Because mm, currently, it's... if you go to if you go to contribute, it well actually if you go to contribute, it just redirects to GitHub. Yep, exactly. Uh, and... What we can do, we can we can move this branch from C contributor strategy repo, move it to uh, to the contribute repo, and point both domains to uh, to the Netlify uh, to the Netlify uh, website. That's that's it. So, however, there's going to be some things like, for example, if you contribute.cncf.io, you know, we should really have this discussion in the general SIG contributor strategy because, like, right now, Carolyn's not here and was not expected. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. I, I'm just saying yep. we're going to have to, if we're going to use contribute.cncf.io, then we're going to have to move things that are currently there. Which mm -hmm. will break someone's links. Um, I don't think it's that much of a problem, but we don't want to do it, you know, without discussing it and without potentially at least posting a warning on CNCF Slack and the TOC thing. Yeah, so that's the thing. And the idea here is that. That will become our publication target for a lot of our advisories and guides and everything else. Everything that's not a template, that'll go into that website. And then, you know, so we'll have some kind of process whereby stuff gets approved to go onto the website. Um, ideally, you know, once we get that set up, I'm going to uh, solicit the TOC to authorize a liaison, probably Matt, I guess. Um, if he's still on the TOC, I've lost track. Um, but AT TOC liaison to approve our decisions there rather than having everything come up for a full TOC vote. Because if we have to have a full TOC vote every time we want to publish an update to a document, it's going to be real slow. So yeah, beyond that. So Charles, the other thing is, we, I've got linked in there the two sort of templates that I created for sort of generic project governance. I wouldn't mind having your eyes on them as somebody who hasn't been involved with any of this, you know, who had a project that recently went through a governance overhaul to think of, you know, hey, if I was just starting a new CNCF project, would these be useful to me? Yeah, okay, I'll take a look. Yeah. Through them. And these aren't no. um, these aren't like live anywhere, right? I have a, I have a markup renderer that I can use. Just curious if it's live somewhere that I can read. No, the PR hasn't been word merged yet. Okay, cool. The um, and you actually kind of need to look at the raw because they're designed to be templates okay. for markdown documents, and there is no markdown template language. So um, the um, so there's a bunch of stuff in there that's actually invisible if you look at it as rendered markdown. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, the, um, yeah, and it's just more I'm you know looking at, hey, would, is this actually going to be useful to people? Like I think it is based on dealing with some of the Red Hat projects, but um, more eyes is good. Okay. Cool. How did the um, Linkerd anchor launch go? Um, good. We've got a few folks interested already, and we're finding ways to get them um, kind of talking to each other as well. Uh, so yeah, Catherine will definitely be chatting about that this afternoon. Um, yeah, we got some interest straight away, and we also reached out to folks who we knew were already basically like they were basically doing the things that we that we want people to do for the program. So um, we've got a good few people just to get started. So the challenge that we're looking at now is just keeping the momentum going or building the momentum and keeping it going, I guess I should say. Yeah. 
um, particularly without in-person events. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, cause like we have a couple of projects that have deferred launching new ambassador programs simply mm. because without having in-person events, there's not that much for the ambassadors to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. We're focusing on like your people become ambassadors or anchors based off of content that they're generating, you know, and it's kind of the way we've approached it is we, we know that you're integrating Linkerd with XYZ. Let's write a blog post about that and share it with folks, or let's, uh, let's put together a tutorial. Um, you know, the difference between a blog post is this is what we did and why we did it. And a tutorial is like step by step by step, because just from my position of working with the community, I see people asking similar questions, but they'll happen like three and four weeks apart. And I'm like, oh, I know somebody just asked that. Uh, they might know. And then we have the free version of Slack. So I, I can't go back very far to find the answers that I'm looking for. So, um, but yeah, it's, we're, we're iterating over it. It's pretty exciting. And um, yeah, Catherine's been doing a lot of the thinking, most of the thinking around it. So I'm excited to, for her to share with you what she's come up with. Yeah, I think that's a really good approach. I think it's, I think it's probably healthy for us now to take sort of a step back and think of, not always think of ambassadors as just the people who fly around to all the conferences and give all the talks. I mean, there's other, other ways to be an ambassador that don't involve spending all of your time on a plane. Yeah, well, yeah. we have we have a good history of the CNCF ambassadors in general, and we definitely don't require them to speak at the at the conferences these days. Uh, however, there are various ways how you can contribute to uh, to the open source world, even not flying to different conferences and speaking there. Like write a blog post, or publish even you know like publish some books. Uh, run or speak at a podcast, like be engaged in the community, be be active with your local community in, in an online or in an on, online or offline way. Uh, like even there are, there are some ways, how can you how can you work with the local community? So definitely uh, ability to speak at the global events, uh, the global physical events is not a single requirement here. Yeah, that's, uh, that's where we didn't even consider like well, on-site events as part of our strategy. We're focusing on doing as much as we can virtually. And, and we've also, we're working internally to have like one member of the team generate one piece of content once a month, right? So that gives us, if only if only our team is doing it, that means for the next two years, we will generate one piece of content per month, which is way lower than we want it to be, but um, that's just internally. So if we're getting folks externally, um, we're hoping to have two to three pieces of content per month. And that's the thing, well, this, this actually this question might be better in one of the other groups, but the thing that I personally, I'm seeing is I feel like people are getting fatigue from virtual conferences. So my focus is to generate content that they can consume on their time, whether that again is, it's either an article, a blog post or a video. Um, so that's, that's where we've been thinking. That's where our head is at on those, that type of content in particular. That being said, I don't want to limit myself to that constrained type of thinking. So um, if you all have other thoughts, um, and I think it's a, a function of, this is a forcing function actually. So we need to start thinking differently and how do we get people, um, give them interesting things, not just things. I don't want to throw a bunch of content out there that people aren't interested in. So. Yeah, these are like questions that are open-ended for us and that we're, we continue to try and answer ourselves. Yeah, 
the um, wait. So, what was the question there? <laughs> there was no question. It's, it's okay. open open ended questions. Like, um, I started to go down the path of if you all have thoughts about alternative content, but then I realized I think that's a better just like open ended discussion. Like, sit down and start throwing things at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah, but uh, that's kind of what we're doing internally. But there are other, uh, yeah. you know, we have our way of thinking, and we want to get other people's way of thinking. Yeah, the only thing I would I would suggest, based on in in the actual core mission for this working group, is to suggest that. There should be a way for your anchors to have a vote in project leadership. That is, their efforts should count towards whatever requirement you have to having eligibility. Yeah, that makes sense. Let me write that down. The, um, Yeah, okay, that's really helpful, thanks. Yeah, and I'll tell you one thing. So there's there's different ways to do that. Um, for some projects, you just say, hey, if you're already, if you're sort of an acknowledged anchor, then you automatically have the ability to vote. Um, assuming, wait, let me look at Linkerd governance. I don't think you have voting right now, do you? No, I don't think we, well, I've never voted on anything. <laughs> It the, might be um, in there, but yeah. Yeah, so so until you actually have, yeah, no, you have basically maintainer council. Um, yeah, because I was looking at you, you have maintainer council. I should have based my maintainer council on yours because you have a ridiculously simple one. Um, <laughs> the, um, but you have a basic maintainer council structure. So there isn't currently any voting um, so if you're not moving to like an electoral structure anytime in the near future, which there may be no good reason for you to do so, my suggestion would be that eventually you actually have make anchors a project in and of their own and give and basically then create anchor maintainers. Um, and it's a way to get people involved with governance out of the anchor program, even in advance of them being code contributors. Yeah, that makes sense to me. The, um... Hey, Bill. Hey, how's it going? The, um... You came in at a good time because we just finished with our earlier topics. And you had some governance related questions earlier. Yeah, I did. Is it a good time to kind of like yes, jump in? Yes, it is. Now? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, so yeah, I guess we're starting a new like working group, um, yeah. like the CNF conformance, and yeah. we presented it to the TOC last week, and they said it might go under like SIG uh, app delivery, SIG networking. But our our question kind of is is if we want to get this like kind of before that happens, we want to get it kind of like off the ground and running at KubeCon. Yes. And we're trying to like get people kind of like in, in charge of that because right now it's kind of like so I work with this at the CNCF and it's kind of being like organized by us, but we'd like to have it be kind of like driven by the community going forwards and we'd like to, to kind of have some like elections and I was wondering if um, there's any kind of like like advice or like standard structure or like template we can use for like elections and like governance of like a, a working group. There isn't, um, because the way that um, governance works for the SIGs is that um, each SIG has a certain small set of, of chairs or leads. Mm -hmm. um, and those people are generally selected by some kind of rough consensus, and then they're approved by the TOC. Yeah. 
Um, so I don't know of any of our SIGs that actually have a more sophisticated mechanism than that. Uh, partly because for the SIGs, it's required that people be approved by the TOC. Yeah. And so nobody ever felt that they needed a more complicated mechanism for, you know, a more representative mechanism for selecting leadership. Um, as far as I know. Um, and that would cover um, which one's SIG networking, SIG runtime, um, hmm. SIG storage, at least all work that way, along with our SIG. Um, so, but as Amy pointed out, the working group thing is less defined. And I guess one of the questions is, well, the CNCF doesn't require you to have any particular mechanism for selecting leadership. And it requires that the TOC ratify your leadership changes. They also don't prohibit you of having a more sophisticated mechanism. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is there a reason for you to have um, some kind of a representative mechanism? Um, so like, it, so is there a reason why to have where we should have like a, a structure or like right in other words will having a more formal structure for representation either engage more potential participants or be a way of avoiding sort of interminable disputes around things this is the two yeah. reasons why you adopt a more sophisticated governance structure is to do one of those two things for both yeah, ours is kind of like the latter, um, where in the telco space, there's kind of like a lot of vendor vendors who have like very entrenched ish interests. And we don't want them to kind of like control the conversation. We want to be driven by like multiple different parties, especially ones uh, like the service providers and stuff. And so we don't want it to be kind of, yeah, I guess kind of like controlled by a few people that already kind of control the ecosystem. We wanted to make sure that we have kind of like a good representation. Okay. So that would suggest some kind of a leadership council with earmarked types of seats. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, vendor seats and service provider seats and say even an end user seat. Mm -hmm. um, with the complexity always that it's hard to define those things. <laughs> yeah. The, um, exactly. Like where does Ericsson fall? Is it a is it a vendor? Is it like a network function provider? Is it an end user because they sell mobile phones? <laughs> yeah. And the other suggestion would be if you're going to go through a complicated election process, you might want to get dispensation from the TOC to not have the requirement that they approve those because it feels kind of pointless to have an election if then the TOC can go, well, nah, or simply delay approval because they're busy with other things, which is the more likely problem. Um, okay. And the nice thing is that because it's not us, because it's specifically being named as a working group and not a SIG, you can make the case that it's different. Yeah. Um, the um, okay, so um, hmm. So, is there somebody on your side who could actually work on definitions? There, I'd be, I'd be post KubeCon and Thanksgiving. I'd be happy to help work on this. Um, it's obviously an area where my employer has some definite interest so I can get work time to spend on it. <laughs> um, the, um, and, um, even, even if I'm telling, hi y'all, I'm going to set things up so that you don't have control over this. Um, <laughs> but, um, that's fine. The, um, and, um, um, but you want to already announced a governance structure at KubeCon? Yeah. That's kind, of that's kind of ambitious, given that KubeCon is next week. And the TOC would have to approve at least the governance structure. OK. 
Okay, so would you recommend maybe announcing that we are going to have like a governance structure, but it's still TBD then? Yeah. Yeah, and the advantage of that honestly is that we can write a draft governance and then run it past your early participants so that they actually um, can supply feedback and have a stake in the governance structure that you end up with. Okay. Um, rather than sort of delivering it as a, you know, here's something that SIG contributor strategy in the Linux Foundation devised as a fait accompli. Um, the, um, so, um, and we don't have any more TOC meetings before KubeCon. No. So there's no good way to even kind of get their blessing on the idea that that um, CNF conformance is going to have its own governance. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe there is. We we'll do it through the mailing list. I think it'd be a good idea to do it through the mailing list because I don't really want to announce anything and then have, say, a TOC member go, hey, we never approved that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would I would caution against maybe overthinking the <clears throat> governance process when you're really kind of just getting started because the the trap that you can fall into is that you spend so much time over engineering it and then it's it's not what you actually needed once you actually start the work and you end up spending too much time on on the process and not enough stuff figuring out not enough time actually doing some of the work and figuring out what you're really going to need over time. Okay. So would you That's recommend not to say you shouldn't put any process in place now? I just would I just would be careful not to over engineer it right away. I don't okay. know if Josh agrees with that, but uh, no, you're absolutely right. Um and you're further right in that you need to look at what the outputs of this governance structure are going to be. Mm -hmm. Like what do you need leadership to actually do? Um, because that will determine the structure that the leadership needs to take. Yeah. Um, I mean, to give sort of difficult, like if, if leadership's role is exclusively going to be approving um, conformance rules and tests, right? Mm -hmm. Then that would argue for some sort of a centralized committee structure, regardless of how they're selected. Whereas if it's more that you're going to have different aspects of conformance worked on in different sub projects, then that might argue in favor of a more composite structure, you know, one in which you have sort of these sub projects and then there's some sort of counsel from the sub projects. Mm -hmm. And leadership is mainly technical in nature. Yeah, I think it's going to be more centralized where that group is defining kind of like what like CNF conformance is. Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. And, and the other thing in terms of Dawn with overthinking is you also kind of have to wait to implement anything until you have enough people involved. Because, yeah. you know, imagine you come up with a governance structure where we have, you know, two vendor seats and three service provider seats and one end user seat, but you actually only have five active participants in the whole project right now. Yeah. Um, How, okay. how many people do you have who are already looking to get involved in this? So we, I've talked with like quite a few people, like across a number of different organizations. Um, so, and quite a few have expressed interest in like being involved so far. But I guess we'll find out at like the meeting at KubeCon is where we're kind of like launching it.
Yeah. Yeah, so I'd say there, Don is right. You really don't. That's another reason why you really don't actually want to have a predefined governance structure. Okay. Because you don't even know who's going to be involved at this point. Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, so okay. So maybe have the first kickoff meeting and say we're going to have a governance structure and like. Yeah. And, and y'all will get to approve it. Yeah. Um, and for right now, they're just, you know, because the important thing is to find out far more important. The important thing is to find out who's going to actually put people onto this. Yeah. Because the last thing you want is a leadership council that's made up of people who are not contributing to developing conformance definitions or tests at all. Yeah. Yeah, and I think sometimes but now focusing on things like like the outputs and you know how you're going to communicate with each other and decision making processes and some of the stuff that that goes around um, the kind of the leadership selection that's a part of governance, I think would probably be a better use of the time right now. Okay. Okay, so get kind of get it off the ground and running, like with us running it and then once we kind of have sorted out who's actually contributing and like working on it, then kind of like, then that's when we actually launch like the, the formal governance process. Like right now, I guess for the time being saying like, we're kind of like a benevolent dictator until we say we understand how it's actually working in practice. Yeah, and I honestly think that you can figure out governance before you're ready to approve any conformance definitions, because it's not like you're going to come up with those the week after. Yeah. Okay. The, um... Cool. Yes, thank you. That, that's super helpful for me. Okay. So I, I know I just uh, jumped in at the last minute here. So I do appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Well, <laughs> you were you were one of the people that invited to come by this meeting for questions about governance. So, um, and if you look at the agenda, we kind of had the section of the meeting unfilled. So, thank you for remembering to come by. Yeah, I just I just saw it in the Slack channel. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> what we're here for. The, um, and, um, cool. Is there anything I can help both of you with? No, it's about it. Um, I mean, when you actually, some point when we have more stuff up, we're working on creating a new website. Mm -hmm. I might ping you and say, hey, we now have a bunch of government re governance resources online. Tell me if these would have helped you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. Um, but we don't have that set up yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, once it is, I'd be happy to like review yeah. it. Cool. Okay. Well, I think that's everything for this meeting, unless you have something else, Don? No, I don't have anything okay. else, I'm good. Okay, we will not have a meeting in two weeks due to the US holiday. Um, if some kind of urgent thing came up, we could schedule an ad hoc meeting, but given that everybody that we touch is going to be involved with KubeCon next week, and then you know a good third to half of them are Americans, I don't expect anything to come up, in which case our next meeting will be in early December. Sounds good. Okay, thanks everybody. Yep, thanks. See ya. Bye-bye.